Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Gallagher. I'm one of the ministers here at the Gadsden Church of Christ located in Gadsden, Alabama. We're extremely glad that you are worshiping with us today through this online avenue. We're going to be continuing to do this for the next little while due to the COVID-19 virus. We hope that you are staying safe and we're praying for those who've been greatly influenced by this. As we worship God together this morning, let's know that no matter where we are in the world, we're watching this together, we are united as we have come before our God, the almighty creator of the heaven and earth. So as we go through this, at the end of service, would you leave us a comment and let us know where you're watching this from? If you're watching it from Facebook Live, you can just leave a comment right below this video. If you're watching it on our website, in the bottom right hand corner, there is a small icon. If you will click that, that will open up a message screen and you can send a message directly to us and we'll get it and be able to respond to you. But we're delighted that you're here and thank you for worshiping God with us today. I do want to remind you that even though we're not in a building such as this, sometimes we can become pretty comfortable where we're at. Whether we're watching this in our pajamas, whether we've gotten up and we've gotten ready and, and we're sitting in our favorite chair, let's always remember that we've come together to worship God. When we come in a building such as this during a normal period of our life, it can become very easy to understand that we are there to worship. But yet sometimes in our home, we can get mixed feelings. Because you might be watching this on a phone, any kind of mobile device, laptop, desktop, computer, or even your television set. And it may be that just last night you were watching a TV show and you were laughing and you were enjoying it or you were just having just a whole lot of fun but now is a time where we come together and we look at that same device, whether a computer or a phone or a TV, and we come together to bow down in respect to the Almighty God. Let us remember that God created this avenue for us, this avenue of worship, where we can bow down together before Him and we can show Him the honor and the respect that He deserves. So as we get into our worship service, let's clear our mind of the things that are around us even though we may be very comfortable. And let's remember that we have come together to worship God this morning. And we've come together with brethren all over our country and even those from other parts of the world that we can serve him together. So let's worship together.
Holy Father, we are so thankful unto you for this privilege and honor we have of meeting together again. Father, we thank you for all the blessings of this life. Thank you, Father, the blessing that we have this avenue that we can continue to meet together, even though it is in our separate locations. Father, we pray that each and every member, their health is continued to be as well as it can be. We know there's some of our members, Father, that need your comforting hand each day of their lives. We pray, Father, also for those that are sad and lonely. Pray, Father, for those that this quarantine because of the virus has called uh, problems in their lives. We know that there are some that cannot handle this situation very well. Others of us, Father, we're so glad that we're able to carry on. Father, we pray for our elders. Pray for the decisions they have to render, Father. Father, we pray for wisdom for them and understanding of your word that they can lead us spiritually. Father, we're thankful for our deacons and the work that they carry on. For the most part, we never see. We know they're doing diligently. Father, for the works of our congregation, we continue to pray for them, especially the School of Biblical Studies in Joss, Nigeria. We always pray for their safety. And Father, we pray that we dedicate our lives each day to be the best servant unto you that we possibly can be. Continue to be with us, Father. Continue to bless us. And always forgive us when we failed to be the servant that you would have us to be. For in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.
again, everyone. Chris Gallagher here, and I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, we're going to begin reading in verse 1. Now, as you're doing that, I'm also going to ask that you do something pretty interesting. For those of you who are part of our Gadsden family, you've heard me say this before. I'm going to ask that you take off your 2020 glasses, your perceptions, put those down for a moment, and let's put ourselves back into the first century. It's going to be pretty hard, but yet, in a time like this, you may enjoy it. You may enjoy getting away from the COVID-19 crisis or the Asian murder hornets or whatever's next in 2020. And you may want to go back to what we may call simpler times. Now, just rem remember for a few moments the story of Israel. Remember that the children of Israel were God's promised people. And those are the ones that waited upon the Messiah to come. And during that period of time, they had their ups and they had their downs. They had a lot of different difficulties. And the reason they had that is sometimes they put their thoughts before God's and they needed to be put back in their right place. But during this period of time, they always held on to the promise of God through Abraham, that covenant that was made with him, that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. And when the children of Israel got very, very comfortable, they wanted something. They wanted the government. They wanted the king. They wanted to be just like everybody else. And God told them, you don't want to do that. Because if you have a king, he's going to tax you, he's going to send your children off to war, and he's going to do all these other things. And we find out through the pages of the Bible that God was exactly right. That's exactly what he did. In fact, the children of Israel even went through a divided kingdom where things couldn't be settled, and so the kingdom was divided for a period of time. But as we get into the New Testament, we find out that the children of Israel are under Roman rule. They are still in their land, but they're under the rule of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire is growing, and it's growing at a very fast rate as they seek to conquer all the places of the world, and really the entire world. They wanted to own it all. And one of those places that they owned at this particular point in time was Israel. So when we read in our Bibles, especially in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read about Roman soldiers. We read about a lot of them, even in the book of Acts, and so on. But our story today, or our account today, is going to be from Luke chapter 7. We're going to run into a Roman soldier called a centurion. Now a centurion could be over a thousand soldiers, he could be over a couple hundred soldiers. It depends on where he was falling in the Roman Empire. But a Roman centurion also is very unique and that he had to learn to read and write. He ought to have known that for years to communicate clearly. And been over the age of 30, he was known for his size, for his build, kind of a, a domineering, almost an intimidating person when you first saw him. But also he had, ex, he had expertise, he had experience in what he did. It wasn't just someone who maybe went through school and graduated. He had some experience in those things. In fact, look at this statement from the first century, and you can see what the Roman centurions were like. It says, The centurion in the infantry is chosen for his size, for his strength and dexterity in throwing his missile weapons, and for his skill in the use of his sword and shield. In short, for his expertness in all of the exercises, he is to be vigilant, temperate, active and readier to execute the orders than receive, that he receives than to talk, strict in exercising and keeping up with proper discipline among the soldiers, and obliging them to appear clean, well-dressed, and to have their weapons constantly rubbed and bright. As you can see, translated into English, that's some pretty strict guidelines for Roman centurion. Roman centurion was going to be in charge of a group of soldiers, and he was going to be put where he was most needed. Now, here's an interesting little fact. As Rome would conquer the world, they typically would draft citizens of the country or of the region that they conquered to be in their army. And that worked in a lot of other places of the world. But according to R.C. Foster in his book, Life of Christ, it didn't work well in Jerusalem. It didn't work well in the place where the Jews or the children of God were. It just wasn't going to happen like that. They weren't going to stand for it. So as a result, in many places around where we read that Jesus is going to be, that the Romans got soldiers from Samaria and they got soldiers from the Greece, from Greece or from the Greeks. So when you start to think about this for a minute, 
they're under Roman rule. They're being occupied by Rome. They're having to pay a lot of taxes. They're having to see all these things take place, and they're waiting for this Messiah, but they're having to constantly put up with Rome. Then some of the soldiers were Samaritans that they didn't get along with. Some of them were going to be Greeks that they didn't get along with. It's no wonder that the Jews did not want to do anything for the Romans. In fact, many scholars believe in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, if anyone compels with you to go with him one mile, go with him two, that has to do with the Roman law. The Roman law was that if the Roman soldier came up to you, a citizen, and said, I need you to carry this, you are obligated to carry that one mile. No further, just one mile. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, if anyone compels you to go one mile, go the extra. And we always say to ourselves, well, that's saying just go the extra step. No, it's not. Jesus is saying the extra mile. Not just the, the effort that you've already put in, but the extra effort and double the extra effort. See, sometimes we think extra step. It's extra mile. It's extra effort. It's going the greater distance because you believe in the greater good. So when we get into Luke chapter 7 this morning, as we read down through this, we're going to read it first, and we're going to come back and take a look at it. I want to remind you of a few things. The Jews are under Roman rule. Being under Roman rule, they did not like. They did not like the Romans. They didn't care for the Romans. But Luke chapter 7 is a very unique situation. So if you have your Bibles, open to Luke chapter 7, and let's begin reading in verse 1. Luke writes, After he had finished all these sayings, that is Jesus, in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick to the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to the elders of the Jews, asking him to come and to heal the servant. And when, had, when they had came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation. He is the one who has built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I, too, am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him said, I tell you that not even in Israel have I found such a faith. And when those who had been sent returned to his house, they found the servant well. Probably many of us have heard this exact account since we've been very little. It's one of those Bible class lessons that we remember. That Jesus found such a greater faith in anywhere else in Israel than this Roman centurion. But I want you to remember exactly the scene that set. The people had just listened to Jesus teach, and he enters Capernaum, and there's all these people that are there. And off in a distance somewhere, you have a Roman centurion and the occupying army of the territory who may not be a Jew, and he's got a servant who's sick. But he heard about Jesus, and he heard about Jesus and he knew that he needed to go to Jesus. Now let's not forget something. Let's not forget this. Number one, the centurion cared. Sometimes we get this perception, we get this perspective on people that a Roman centurion just doesn't care. He just doesn't care at all. He's rough, he's gruff, he's tough. He's a trained killing machine, and he really doesn't care about anybody else. But this centurion had a servant that was highly valued. It meant a lot to the centurion. He was a person. Let's never forget that as we look through Scripture, that people throughout all time, people are people. Some people may seem really rough, and we get this perspective of them being really rough, but deep down, they probably have a very honest heart. They're probably seeking the greater good. So here you have a Roman centurion who hears about Jesus. So remember, number one, the servant, I mean, the centurion cared. Also, notice what the centurion does. 
The centurion is a person in a position of authority. He's over everything in Capernaum because this is going to be his territory. So he sends to the elders of the city. Now, if you go research who the elders of the city were, you'll find out that the elders of the city are going to be the Pharisees and they're going to be the scribes. They're going to be the leading people of the city. They're going to be the people just a little bit later in Scripture that aren't going to like Jesus. In fact, based upon some things previous to Luke chapter 7 and also previous to Matthew chapter 8 where the companion story of this is found, I think that they probably didn't care for Jesus a lot right then and there. But there's something unique. The centurion knew what to do. He knew where to go. He knew that he needed to go to the elders of the city and have them get Jesus. And he knew that. So he sends to the elders of the city, and notice what the elders of the city do. The elders of the city come back to Jesus, and they say, if I can use a Chris Gallagher paraphrase for a moment, they say, you've got to do this for him. You really need to go heal this servant because this Roman centurion right? The Roman centurion has built us our synagogue. Isn't that very interesting? Put yourself outside of what you know and go backwards for a moment. These individuals who are not going to like Jesus probably don't like him now. Now they come to Jesus and they say, you've got to do this because, listen, he, he, he's a good guy. He built us our synagogue. The Roman centurion cared about people. No matter how rough and gruff we may think he is, not only did he care about the servant, but he built these people a synagogue. Look at the passage. When you look at the passage again, you find the words, he built us a synagogue. Those who look at this from a language standpoint and a historical standpoint, many people believe that this building of the synagogue came out of the centurion's own pocket, which made the centurion very rich, which is another interesting point. So he's built this for him. So these elders of the city, they come to Jesus and they say, you need to go heal him. And look what happens. Look at the verse again. As you look at this, I want you to look in verse 6. It says, and Jesus went with him. So Jesus listened to the elders and he says, okay, we'll go. So Jesus goes with them. He's traveling with the elders of the city. And it says that when he was not far from the house... The centurion sent word to Jesus. The centurion sent his, sent his friends to Jesus, knowing that Jesus was on his way. You know what the centurion had? The centurion had faith. Now, we know that from what's said later, but I want you to look at the faith. If I send for Jesus, I know that Jesus is going to come. He had that faith in knowing who Jesus was. Remember that. So it says when he sent his friends, now remember, once again, he sends his friends to talk to Jesus before he even enters the house. Now the centurion is probably a very wealthy individual, probably has a beautiful home, but notice what he says about and to Jesus. Look at the passage. It says, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Roman centurion, occupying country, says to Jesus. He's heard everything that happens, and he says, Lord, I am not even worthy. Calls him Lord, calls him Master. Lord, I'm not even worthy that you should come under my roof. He knows the power and the majesty of Jesus. He knows about that. Or else, why would, why would he send for Jesus if he didn't think about that? But he knows Jesus enough that he knows that Jesus has the healing power and that Jesus can make good things or great things happen. Look at the next phrase that he says. He says, therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. I say to another, do this, and he does it. The Roman centurion tells Jesus, I'm not even worthy that you should step foot into my house. But he understands authority. 
He understands authority enough because remember, he's a Roman centurion. He can look at somebody and he can tell somebody, pick up my stuff and carry it one mile. And by law, they have to do it. He understands the authority of that. But did you notice what the centurion does to Jesus? He humbled himself before the sight of God. A Roman centurion humbled himself before Jesus because he says, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should do this. If you just say the word, I know it's going to happen. Remember Gideon in the Old Testament? Gideon had to go through the little tests of God. The fleece dry and the ground wet, the ground dry and the fleece wet. And he had, he had to go through all those different things. But then you have a Roman centurion who we would not think, who we would presume would not be part of this, tells Jesus, you have authority just to say the word and my servant's going to be healed. Not only did this centurion care about others, not only did he know where to go, not only did he understand authority, but his faith was an active faith. He had the knowledge of Jesus, but you see it come out through his words. You see it come out through his actions because he is able to say to Jesus, just say the word. The Roman centurion, possibly in charge of a thousand soldiers, one of the great ones of Rome, a great soldier of Rome, in charge of this city, in charge of even building a synagogue for the Jews, tells Jesus, I'm not worthy that you should come to me. He tells Jesus, you're better than me. Not only you're better, but you're much better than me. Just just say the word. I, I, don't, I don't presume to come to you. I, I don't presume for you to come, but just, just say the word. Notice the next verse. The next verse says, When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. When Jesus heard the words from the centurion as he sent friends as his representative, because the centurion seems to be staying at the side of his servant that he does not want to leave because he cares so much. When Jesus heard these words, it says that he marveled. He was amazed. And notice what he says. It says, he marveled and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you the truth, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Jesus tells the people around him, listen, you want to talk about faith? I haven't found this in Israel. Now remember what Israel was. Israel contained the children of Israel. Israel was going to be the promised people of God. But when Jesus came to them, what did they do? They rejected him. When the, John the Baptist even came and he saw Jesus and called Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When John the Baptist told them that you've got to repent, that you've got to be baptized because there's coming a kingdom and you need to be part of it, what did they do? They rejected John the Baptist. Why did they reject him? We always have said they rejected because they just didn't want to believe. And that's right. They rejected because John the Baptist had some harsh words. And that's right. But they rejected him because their faith in God was not strong enough to allow the acceptance of God's word. Their faith in God was not strong enough. And here you have a Roman centurion, probably not a Jew from everything that we can understand, a Roman or somebody from another foreign country who humbles himself before God and whose faith allows him to even say, God or Jesus, you say the word. You don't even have to come into my house. In fact, I'm not worthy for you to do that. He knew where to go. He knew where to go in the understanding that he was going to have that Jesus could do that. So what can we learn from this? We can learn several things. Number one, we need to learn this, that you need to have faith. When I say faith, we're talking about a living and we're talking about an active faith. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. I really like, personally, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 when it comes to faith. Because it says, without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. 
So if we're talking about faith, let's ask the question. Do you believe? And not just do you believe because it's a Sunday morning and because you're watching this online and you go, well, of course. No, do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe that when you pray to God that you're asking God in faith, nothing doubting, so you are not like a wave of the sea that's tossed to and fro, but that you really believe that God is going to hear those words as you pray? Do you believe? And if you do believe, do you believe that God is? Do you believe that God exists and God created everything that we see around us? Let me ask you a very, maybe a timely question. Are you more scared of a virus? Or are you more scared of not being with God for eternity? If we would treat sin, or if many rather, would treat sin and the avoidance of sin like we're trying to avoid a virus, our world would be a much better place. A much better place. But instead, sometimes we focus on the physical. When we need to realize that God is and that God will, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, reward those that diligently seek him. Those that are seeking God, God is going to take care of. Do you have that kind of faith? Do you have that active faith? Second of all, I want you to remember this. This is something that we can learn today. Faith comes from places where we least expect it. How many of us looking at Roman centurion, honestly, if we were during the time of Jesus, would have pictured in our mind, that guy's got great faith. Instead, we looked at him and gone, it's just a Roman. But inside, each and every person is their ability to have faith in God. So even the person that you think may not obey God, may not even approach God, they might. They might. I will really admit to you, over the past little while, over the past about four weeks, I have personally seen people who I never thought cared anything about religion, start to care about religion, start to ask for prayer, start to say, I need to try to do better. Because the realization is that there's something greater than this world, something greater than what we see around us. And if that's the good that comes out of all of this, then that's the good that we need. And that's the good that we as Christians need to look to as an opportunity to share the message of Jesus. So, You've got to have faith. And you've got to realize that faith comes in places and comes through people that sometimes we do not expect. And the third thing that I want you to remember is this. Your faith helps somebody. Now, if you're a parent, you already know this and you've already seen this. But I want you to take the parenting situation out for a moment. Look at the centurion. The centurion approached Jesus on behalf of somebody else. The servant didn't go to Jesus. The centurion did. He went to Jesus and said, Jesus, help because of his faith, the servant was healed. It wasn't the servant's faith. It was the centurion's faith in coming to Jesus. Your faith is important to someone. As you approach God through your prayers, it's important to someone. As you live your life, every day that you live, as a shining example of the light of Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through verse 16, it's important to someone. Your faith is important. Your faith is eternally important. Because we know that without faith, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, it's impossible to please God. So as that centurion came to Jesus, Jesus looks at everybody around him who's followed him into Capernaum and he says the famous phrase that we just read about that he had not found in Israel such a great faith than is in that centurion. Let's make a commitment today that we're going to grow in our faith, that we're going to grow in our faith, that we're going to grow in our grace and our knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But let's make sure that we understand that our faith needs to be living, it needs to be active, and it needs to be a part of our life. I hope that you will today, and I hope that you realize that your faith will affect somebody else. And faith will come from the times, it will come from the places, 
And it will come from the people sometimes that we least expect. But let's remember, the salvation of God is available for everyone. Let us bow in a moment of prayer. Our Father and our God, we humbly come before you this morning thanking you for each and everything. Father, we thank you for blessing our lives. We thank you for the greatness of the things that we see around us because of you. We thank you, Father, that you've been with us, that you've granted us another day to live upon this earth. It is our prayer, Father, that as we come to you, that we'll seek your presence and that, Father, we will be humble, knowing that you love us and that you care for us. Father, help us always to grow in our faith. Help us to read through your word. Help us to study it. Help us as we go throughout our lives, Father, to make your word a priority. Make it the best book that we could ever read and the best life that we could ever live. Continue to watch over us. Continue to be with us. And may we seek to serve you each and every day. It's in your son Jesus' name we ask this prayer. Amen. Thank you again for being with us this morning. Our services are not over. We still have a couple songs, then we're going to have our communion and our collection, and we'll close out with a few announcements. But let's sing another song together.
there are several accounts of Jesus introducing what we call the Lord's Supper to the disciples in the Gospel. And other accounts throughout the New Testament of Christians observing the Lord's Supper. Today we gather here at this time to remember that Christ gave us the example of how to take this bread and this cup and what they represent by his suffering on the cross and his death and his resurrection. At this time, let us take our minds back to the cross as we bless the bread. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for everything that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity that we have together around this table to partake of this bread that represents the body that was hung on the cross for us. Let each person, Father, examine themselves and take on taking a well-pleasing manner in thy sight. In Christ's name, amen. In like manner now, let us look back to the cross as we bless this cup that represents the blood that was shed. Let us bow. Father, at this time we ask that you bless this cup and this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was shed, shed on the cross for us. Father, we do not understand the pain and suffering that you went through for us, but we thank you for it. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to take of this, that we know that we are washed through your, with your blood. This time, Father, we ask that you bless this cup. Let each one examine themselves and take the well pleasing manner in our sight. In Christ's name. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we're commanded to lay by in storage as God has prospered us. At this time, we take this opportunity to give back to the church that God has prospered us. Let us bow. Father, we thank you for everything that we have. We thank you for our families, for our jobs, for the opportunities and the ways that we are able to support and take care of ourselves. At this time, Father, we ask that you be with us help us to have cheerful hearts as we give back a portion of what you've given to us back to you thank you again father for everything we have in christ's name amen Thank you for being with us today. We hope that you have had a blessed service. We hope that we have worshiped God together in spirit and in truth. And that is our prayer every single time that we come together. Be sure if you're visiting with us that you leave us a message so we can be encouraged about brethren from all over the world uh, being with us. But once again, we thank you for being here. We hope to see you again this evening at 5 p.m. as we gather together once again through this online avenue of service. Thank you very much. We hope that you have a blessed day. Let us pray. Dear Father, we come to you now. We thank, we're thankful for the blessings we have, Lord. We're thankful through, for the technology we have to worship you, Lord. All together, maybe in our own homes, but we're still together, Lord. We're still here to worship you. 
I pray that we'll have a good week, that we'll all be safe, we'll all be protected. We ask for your guidance for us to make the right decisions. I pray that all we do, we bring glory and honor in your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.